and big advocate. Ever on the show. Hey, good evening. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Can you hear me okay? I can. How about you and me? Yep, I got you. All right. So. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for joining tonight. Um, I was telling people we're, we're going to be talking with Danielle Thompson. She's the president of the International Dyslexia Association, Oregon branch, dedicated teacher, uh, advocate of students, and all around amazing human, uh, first and foremost. I wanted to start the show with what got you on the track of work in the dyslexia community? Well, about the same time, uh, people close to me found out that they were dyslexic, and I realized I didn't know very much. And that was uh, a, a friend of mine, her daughter, who's at the school I was teaching at, uh, and then my nephew, who was at a different school, and both of them were uh, like going into their senior year of high school and found out they were dyslexic about the same time. So I'm having conversations um, with, with those folks and um, realizing that the information that I had or that I was getting was mixed messages. And in many cases, we would come to find out not correct uh, and confusing. And as someone who's in education, well, that's just embarrassing. Um, I felt like I needed to learn more and then help us do better in, in terms of how we um, teach our kids with dyslexia. So I, uh, I began to learn more on my own, but also found the International Dyslexia Association, uh, applied for a scholarship to attend the international conference, got it, uh, went, met um, many of the board members who are on the board now or former board members there. Um, enjoyed all the learning that um, was afforded to me and um, have been a part of this group ever since because in meeting these um, amazing board members and learning everything I was learning along the way, I recognized that this was a group I wanted to stay a part of. I have a question on this, on this, on this subject before we dive into dyslexia. So often we encounter problems or issues and they're easy just to kind of let them go or they'll figure themselves out. You encountered students that were challenged and decided to throw yourself full into investigation mode. Has that always been a characteristic of yours or was this uh, a special case? Like that's, I mean, it's just pretty impressive to see well, that type of dedication. I think uh, teachers, we think we're all in. I thought I was already all in. I thought I knew about dyslexia, but it was this vague notion of what dyslexia was. Um, but then when it's, you know, people close to you, it, it, it hits you in a different way. Um, and I, I felt this great urgency to help um, those people that I was, you know, most close to um, help improve um, their situation with school and learning. Um, and then as I was doing that, I'm also recognizing how many students in my classroom that this has explained over the years um, and, it, and it's ongoing. So um, well, I thought I was all in before, then it just kicked up an, a, a notch. So if, if teaching was my first passion, then layered on top of that is um, learning about the learning differences of my students um, and, and doing better. And, and when did you join the board? When did you join the? Uh, 2015 was that annual meeting. So 2016 is when I started. Not, okay. not too long ago. Uh, yeah, no, it's, I mean, a short time. And then you became <laughs> vice president of the board. Was that in 2017 or 20? Um, I was secretary for a bit. Um, okay. Regular board member, then secretary, then vice president. Um, I think that was 2018. Because I remember when I met you, I just saw all the work that you were doing from teaching teachers to teaching your own students, like that constant flow and then all the creative projects that went along with that. What was some of the things that just stuck out to you that you were getting your hands in um, and, and learning about dyslexia as you were you kind of learned it and then you kind of started teaching it. So where did that, when did those lines cross? 
Well, um, in in trying to help um, the people that I care about, um, I, I got trained in uh, a program of structured literacy so I could help tutor them. And then that has sort of expanded to people that I don't know. Um, but also I was learning about how to teach about dyslexia to um, to educators and teachers. And so that the simulation experience, one that the IDA Northern California branch puts out, and then also the Dyslexia Training Institute puts out, those simulation experiences are a very powerful way to begin to think about dyslexia in a way that you haven't before. So we did a simulation at Forest Grove High School for our staff, and it was, it was a pretty short version of it because we, it was a before school situation. Um, but I think we had about an hour and we moved, you know, 80 to 90 some staff through these different simulation experiences, thanks to the help of board members who came, drove out to Forest Grove to do this. And so many of the staff commented afterwards, I can't believe, you know, I didn't know this. Um, I've never felt like this before. Uh, you know, this uncomfortable feeling you get when you're you're trying to do something, you know you're capable and intelligent, and yet you can't meet the expectations. And uh, that was, you know, supremely rewarding to, to spur me on to continue to do that. And that's where um, I remember one of the first events that you attended to was a simulation at Lake Oswego for, that, for the teachers there. Um, so a combination of learning a, a program of structured literacy to help the people I care about, and then to figure out how to translate that into senior English class but also then um, having educators learn more about their learners. Because this is the most common learning difference we'll see in our classroom, I feel like we need to talk about it and teach about it in a whole different way uh, and not make it be hidden uh, and, and not have these kids come to me their senior year who, who have uh, difficulties reading, writing, and spelling, and then they doubt themselves, and then they don't engage you know, in their own future. Um, and we all know students like that too. So. So some of that is even self-preservation. Um, so I don't, I don't have students in my class that you know, are, are shut down to opportunities and learning um, because now I have even better tools in my toolbox to help those students. But the really hard part is convincing them that I can you know, and that they can trust that this time, this process will be helpful to them. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, what, what is the biggest challenge with one educating students and and it sounds like it's it's getting the buy-in getting them to believe that these tools will actually work yes that is so yeah. relationships help trust building helps all of that takes time uh, in a classroom or a tutoring situation um and and years of um you know self-doubt with these students is really hard to crack sometimes it's not that i don't want to keep trying because i definitely do and also with adults and their misconceptions about dyslexia. So I face that too with um, you know, uh, teachers that I encounter in trainings or elsewhere who will, will still comment about uh, people who can't spell there, there, and there. You know, and, and so what they're revealing is that they don't know enough about learning differences and we should help. Yeah, it's interesting because we still see messages all the time on if you can't spell there, they're right. Like, get out like what do you do you know those messages are still being portrayed across multiple channels be it in the classroom or even outside the classroom and i think knowledge of what dyslexia is and how that might be a challenge is so important for people to to realize that this is actually like this is a learning challenge that people deal with and something that can be coached and helped and and tutored but there's, there's a point where we have to just accept where people are at too. That's right. And so while I wanna help my students become better readers, writers, and spellers and feel good about themselves and the way that they learn, I also wanna have them uh, embrace the type of learner that they are, celebrate their strengths, um, and, and not, not always approach them from you know, like a deficit model or a fixing model. Um, one thing I want to say about you and this program and everyone who's come before me being interviewed by you is by adults and students sharing their stories like in formats like this and in our trainings, um, it, it helps lift everyone up. And I really appreciate that because 
you're demystifying this for all of us that need to understand that we work with people with dyslexia, they're in our classrooms, um, and that it's the most common learning difference. And we need to just do better at that. Well, it was interesting because for those on the line that don't know about these simulations, these simulations give teachers or educators the chance to experience what it's like to have dyslexia. And what the one question I think we always ask is, did you feel like you lost your intelligence? And they don't, but they feel the struggle and the shame that comes with it being in the classroom from the simulation. And with the trust building part, this we have a student panel that sits in and listens to these teachers explain how hard it is. I think you build trust that way because they realize like there is this commonality that having dyslexia is a challenge that when you experience the symptoms of it, it's as equally hard as when you're a student who's going through it. What, what would you like to see happen in the education system? Well, I would like to see us um, have, uh, have our um, teachers be better prepared to teach all students how to read um, no matter, you know, if they're, they have dyslexia or are challenged in other ways. And when you know how to help a student with dyslexia learn how to read, you know how to help all struggling readers. And that process, it doesn't matter how young or old they are when you learn how to teach reading. So I've taught uh, students who are, you know, adults who are you know, 24, 25 years old, um, I've taught young kids in kindergarten and the processes and the scope and sequence and the way that you teach it is the same. You just vary, you know, your interactions and maybe the interface for, for the student. So I would like to improve that uh, through our teacher education programs and our, our in-service trainings for teachers. Um, I would like to have uh, uh, universal design um, happening in our school system where we have this acknowledgement that we set up our classroom for um, all the needs of our students to be successful right out of the gate, whether that's opportunities for access to assistive technology, uh, more, more time, um, uh, audio books, etc. I would like to see that you know, at, at every level, in addition to teachers openly talking about neurodiversity at a very young age, because when you're struggling with dyslexia, you don't know that that person right next to you that just finished, I don't know, adding and subtracting really, really fast and you're not done yet. You don't know that their brain is using a different process than yours, uh, but that you may be equally intelligent um, unless you talk about things like that. So I would love to see those conversations. And, and I know that many teachers are doing that. I'd love to see more teachers um, having those conversations with kids from a young age all the way on up so that when I have a conversation like that with a high school senior, uh, they, you know, they, they completely have heard it before and, and have a better sense of, okay, I get it. Even though you know, it can be a hidden learning difference, we wanna try to make it visible if we can. Um, yeah. what else? I'd like to have um, adults in the workplace talk more about their dyslexia too. Um, like you do, Jesse does. It, it helps us transform our workplaces when we have people talk about the way that they learn best and how they can be most successful. And then we can stop being, you know, uh, judgmental about spelling. Yeah, it seems it seems really logical when you say it that way, right? Like you have capable minds that you want to put into the game, into the work environment, into our school system and bring them to the table and not let these learning challenges be a distraction from their ability to contribute. And it seems like that, that barrier just makes so much sense, but it seems like it's a hard hurdle that we've years and years to make inches worth of progress. Yeah. What, um, where do you think it can happen? Does it have to happen at the highest level or can it, can it happen grassroots through the teachers? Like where, where does this need to? Well, it's, it's happening already on a number of fronts through um, parents um, and, and other uh, organizations in addition to the International Dyslexia Association like decoding dyslexia chapters across the country. Um, but it's also happening with teachers who are teaching right now um, you know, influencing the type of in-service 
that they are receiving. Um, and we have university systems who are seeking to change the way that their education programs work and their reading programs work. So um, I think grassroots is always where you're going to see, um, I don't know, that wave gain momentum, but I, I, I'd like to see uh, the changes continue on all those fronts I just named. Yeah. And like the work of our, our volunteer board um, is very inspiring and little by little becomes a lot. And that's been obvious just in the short time that I've been on the board, but in seeing the legacy of the people who came before me uh, and what they helped lay the foundation for. And, and many of them often come back and are still involved in, and all of that matters and is making a difference. It's pretty powerful. What, um, what message would you have for parents that are trying to, maybe they have an early student or just trying to figure this out? What, what message would you have for them? And how could, how could we, how would you suggest they get support? Well, I feel for the parents, I often will get a phone call or an email and I can, I can just feel the stress. They want to help their struggling child right away uh, and good for them for reaching out. But I'm sorry for that, you know, that stress when you see your kid like a kindergartner running away from class or hiding under the tables already at a young age, they figured out that this is not a place for them. So um, I would say for parents, there is help out there. And the International Dyslexia Association is a good place to start, particularly the Oregon branch. We have uh, a grid with a lot of information for parents, including what do you do when you think your child might have difficulties reading or writing or spelling, but you're not even sure if it's dyslexia. And we have those steps laid out in a flow chart and a video. But also what's nice is uh, we have provider directories to find tutors. We have fact sheets and information that you can share with uh, teachers. And we have people that you can talk to. So I would say to parents, um, please, if you have concerns, um, check out your local branch of the IDA, which in our case is or.dyslexiaida.org. And one good thing is um, if, you, if your first language is not English, um, in all the 44 branches across the United States and one in Ontario, on the IDA websites, we've been gifted the Browse Aloud feature uh, by Text Help. And if you click on that, you can transform the, the web pages into any language, and then you can also have it be um, read aloud to you. So that can be very helpful. So inclusive. Yeah, no, because we had, we had a question on the line about that. So that, that's great information um, for the parents out there. And then can you try to balance the what you what you are learning or you might know will help your child learn to read and write and spell in school with protecting their uh, their passions or their gifts or nurturing areas um, where they get a respite from that way of learning that's really really hard for their brain I think that's so important with the outlets you know be it sports or music or art, but letting them build the confidence through their outlets and through where they're naturally passionate about or naturally have drive to, to work in those areas. Because then when they go and tackle those learning challenges through traditional forms of reading and writing, they have that confidence that's still intact. Once that gets shattered, you're, you're on an uphill battle. Yes. So the rule is you get the last word um, of the night. What would that be? Um, well, I wanted to mention a couple things that we have upcoming, even though if you see this video later, um, you, you, you still might be able to connect with what I'll mention. But one is, is to, to know that there are some upcoming events through our branch or areas of support for um, adults with dyslexia um, and so that's someone who's 18 years or older. So if you have a, a senior in high school that's getting ready to, to figure out what they want to do next, or um, you are an adult with dyslexia, um, we have a, a network group that will be meeting at the beginning of February. And um, that's called the Oregon Dyslexia Professional Network. And we'd love for you to join and see if this can be helpful for you. And then we can also learn from you. 
So um, that information can be found on our website and maybe Jared in, our, in your link or maybe in this one, the Dyslexia You Are Not Alone bio. And then um, Jared, you wrote this great book, uh, Running the Distance. And um, parents, uh, it's on now uh, Learning Ally. If your child has a Learning Ally account, you can find it there. Um, you can also download it from Google Play. Um, and the proceeds of all of that goes to the International Dyslexia Association, either the Home Office or to our Oregon branch to help student scholarships. And so um, keep that in mind when you're looking for ways to have your student uh, connect in a story um, of someone else who's, you know, walked the walk and gone through a journey that's similar, maybe to what your child might be going through. So last words. Um, that would be uh, for all of us in our roles, whether that's parent, student, you know, educator, support specialist, um, to be open and to keep learning. Beautifully said. I just, Danielle, I just want to thank you for your work and dedication and what you do for the Oregon community and beyond and just how appreciative we are of all your work and effort. Thanks. Thanks to you too. You have a great night. Thank you so much for taking the time on a Monday. Yeah, you too. Take care. Take care.